Hey everyone, and welcome to this week's Azure Update, the 7th of November. As always, have the chapters. You can jump to any particular update you care about the most. No new videos this week because I've been in Asia all week. Uh, basically, it was uh, left on Saturday afternoon. So you arrived in Malaysia Monday morning. And then in Malaysia, Kuala Lumpur, I got to take part in the AI tour in Kuala Lumpur. Then that afternoon, I flew to Singapore where I got to take part in the Executive Connection. It was my first time ever in Asia. I was literally there for two days, really. So it was a crazy amount of travel. But that's why no new videos this week. Normal service uh, will resume next week. So on to what's new on the compute side. So the HB V5 virtual machines, so they're part of the High Performance Compute Series VMs, are now in GA. So the big thing here is they feature 6.9, so these seven terabytes per second of memory bandwidth across 400 to 450 gigabytes of RAM. So it can have up to nine gigabytes of memory per core. So you can configure that and up to, I think, 352 AMD Epic Zen 4 CPU cores. And they also provide 800 gigabits per second of InfiniBand from NVIDIA networking. So you think these high-performance computing, these supercomputers need massive connectivity between nodes as well. And you get 15 terabytes of local NVMe SSD storage. So basically super powerful, high memory, very high performance, very high connected uh, series of virtual machines. On the networking side, so for ExpressRoute now has this resiliency validation in GA. And this means a few different things. So one of the things you can now do is test failovers for connections to your gateway. So you can think about, hey, I have my gateway, my virtual network, and I connect it to n number of express route circuits. So now I can say, well, let's disconnect one of those circuits and ensure the failover happens as expected. It will also now show you redundancy for the various prefixes you have and even help you visualize the traffic on the gateway. Now, building from this, we now have this idea of the Express Route Resiliency Index. So the index is a score based on your Express Route Resiliency, the zone redundant gateway usage, advisory recommendations, and results of these resiliency validation tests. And the whole point about this is you can now work to improve the score because you're going to get uh, recommendations and it will show you, hey, if this has a high impact on your score. So it's going to give you a prioritized list of things you can do to improve the resiliency uh, of your express route. So then we have this uh, express route end-to-end -end connectivity monitor has gone GA. And the big deal here is as I now go ahead and create or update my express route connections, I can enable the connection monitor as part of that experience. So rather than having a separate configuration step post the configuration, it will just be part of setting this up. So monitoring will be active from day one. Now, it still requires an Azure virtual machine and an on-premises set of endpoints to help monitor and test that end-to-end -end connectivity. So you still have to specify those things. On the storage side, so the Azure NetApp files now has an object rest API. Uh, this is available in preview. So the point of this is I can use that NetApp Files object rest API against my Azure NetApp Files instances. It's S3 compatible API. And so if I'm used to maybe using the AWS storage side, I can now use those same sets of APIs I was used to against Azure NetApp Files. If I'm now creating a cloud native set of services, well now I can also use this API to go and interact with the storage. Storage plan failover has gone GA. So if I have a geo-redundant account, so the paired region has an async replica of the content, you can now switch between the primary and secondary as required. So this is really good for maybe testing your disaster recovery, but also being proactive. Hey, if you see there's a, an event coming, maybe a natural storm, something like that, then maybe I want to go and switch over proactively so I'm just ready ahead of it. So this will work on general purpose V2 storage accounts, both flat and hierarchical namespace. Now if I turn on the hierarchical namespace, it now becomes that Azure Data Lake Storage Gen 2. The object level replication metrics have gone GA. So in addition to thinking about a geo-replicated storage account where it's, 
hey, the storage account content replicated to the paired region, and it's the same storage account. With object level replication, I can replicate at a container level or an object level to a storage account region of your choice. So it gives me a lot more flexibility compared to that fixed account level region pairing. So now there are metrics now in GA that will show me the pending operations and the pending bytes so I can understand what is the state of that replication. Now, both of those metrics are emitted in various buckets of time. So less than five minutes, five to 10 minutes, 10 to 15 minutes, et cetera. So it will show me how long the operations have been pending replication to that destination account. And for my ultra disk, remember ultra disk is the lowest possible latency, the highest performance. They've now changed the way I can provision these. So for example, now I can provision in one gigabyte sets of capacity instead of different capacity tiers. The maximum IOPS is now a thousand per gigabyte, so that's gone up. A uh, hundred IOPS is the minimum per disk, along with one megabytes per second minimum per disk. So they've, they've changed the way the maximums work and the way the minimums work, so it gives you a lot more flexibility. On the database side, so the document DB is now got this Kubernetes operator, so it's open source. So the point of this is I can now run DocumentDB on Kubernetes. So DocumentDB is a MongoDB compatible open source document database built on PostgreSQL. And what this operator does, it extends the Kubernetes with some custom resource definitions and makes it easier for you to deploy and manage these DocumentDB clusters. So if you're using familiar tools like kubectl and Helm, this will now just fit right in and I can use those same primitives to manage it. My SQL Flexible um, now has this dedicated standard Azure load balancer. So that's going to now, as part of my high availability configurations, I have a better failover experience. Cosmos DB for my NoSQL now has a query advisor as part of the .NET SDK. So this will help you optimize your queries to make them more efficient. Remember, we're always dealing with these request units and the request units then drive the cost. So what this query analyzer will do is help me make my queries more efficient to reduce the RUs and therefore reduce my cost. Also, again, for the NoSQL API, Cosmos DB Duo Geospatial now has a distance ordering. So if I have my geospatial queries, I can now order by a ST underscore distance. So that means order by distance from a given point or geojson object. So I no longer have to go and calculate the distances separate in my code or client side. I can now just order by those. So it's going to make it a lot easier to handle distance-based interactions um, in my work with Cosmos DB. The SQL Server Management Studio now has GitHub Copilot integration. So if I'm trying to write my T-SQL statements, in addition to maybe answering questions about my SQL database environments, it's all just nicely integrated in with uh, SSMS uh, available in preview. SQL Database Hyperscale now has multiple geo replicas available in preview. So remember, Hyperscale separates the compute and the page servers that gives me a higher potential scale or higher potential performance capacity, but I can now have multiple of those geo secondary replicas in my environment. And for SQL database and elastic pools, but not hyperscale, I can restart my instances from the portal now. So if I go to the maintenance section of the portal, you'll now have the option to restart those databases yourself. And Postgres SQL Flexible now supports premium SSD v2 for the read replicas. So the big deal here is SSD v2 lets me go up to 80,000 IOPS per replica. Remember, I can have multiple replicas. Actually, in a two-stage hierarchy, I can have a replica of a replica, so I can potentially have a, a lot of replicas in the environment. And finally, the Azure Model Context Protocol server has gone GA. Remember, Model Context Protocol is all about a standard way to communicate with these services that can give additional knowledge, tooling, even prompts to my AI application. But additionally, that MCP server reflects its capabilities in a manner that is understood directly by the generative AI models. I don't have to try and explain what that MCP server can do. So now Azure has an MCP server to help your AI applications, including things like GitHub Copilot, 
uh, work with the Azure services. And that was it. Pretty quick update this week. As always, uh, have a great week. Have a great weekend. And until next video, take care.